One to six, that's what I'm supposed to do, right? <laughs> so what's going to happen here, just so that you see, because the first puzzle especially is going to go by pretty fast. <laughs> the grid's going to come up and it's going to look like the grid you all saw. And then Dr. Phil's going to analyze the clues. And it analyzes the clues eight at a time. And they'll be highlighted in purple. So you'll see all these purple words flying by. It does the long words first, and then it does the shorter words late, last. That's because it wants to finish them all simultaneously. And after it does that, it's going to fill in the letters. And I'll, I'll talk about the actual fill when it's up there. <coughs> the interface knows the right answer. Dr. Phil doesn't know the right answer, as you'll see later. So a letter that it puts in that's wrong will be highlighted in yellow. <coughs> and a letter that's put in that's right will just look like a normal letter. And you're going to see this all happening sort of in real time on my machine. So it says, this puzzle is easy. Okay, it's done. <laughs> now let me just hold on for a minute. So, now it knows this puzzle took five seconds. Okay. But it knows, oh, wow, excellent. But it knows that there's no credit for stopping, so it uses the rest of the minute, give or take, to check its work. And what it does is it throws out each word <coughs> and says, okay, what if I weren't allowed to put go in the upper right? And it solves the whole puzzle over with that one restriction that it can't put go up there. And it says, nah, it didn't come out as good. So then it tries another word. And if it gets that far, it'll try the words in pairs as it's trying more and more. The story on the letters here is that the color of the letter reflects its certainty in the word that it's inserted. So here we have SA crossing um, yens. 55 across is an op-ed piece, e.g. five letters. It really likes SA there. It's probably seen this clue for SA. Yens, 58 down, hankering is four letters. It's probably seen this clue for yens. Blue means it hasn't really seen exactly this clue, but it's seen a clue a lot like this. So a classic comic reality show, 49 across, Candid Camera, it has seen a reality show, Candid Camera, or a classic show, or a show. So words are showing up that suggest Candid Camera to it, so it's pretty happy to put Candid Camera in. Simply, sauce, saucer full for a cat, the answer is cream. It hasn't seen this exact clue, but saucers, but cream and saucers or cream and cats has probably all shown up before, and that makes it very happy to put cream in, which is why those are colored blue. Black <coughs> means it really has no idea why this word is here, but at least it's a word. So Frank Sinatra, <coughs> a My Way singer, excuse me, <coughs> it doesn't know what it has to do with Frank Sinatra, but Frank Sinatra's in the database, that's good, so it sticks it in. Similarly, Frank Sinatra? Does that actually say Red, it says Sinatra. Red, red, redone, like many homes on HGTV. It has no idea what's going on. But redone is a word, so that's good, so in it goes. Later on, you will surely see other colors. Purple is this isn't even in my database, but at least it's a sequence of words. And red is, this is a completely random sequence of letters as far as I can tell, but I appear to be stuck with it. So just so you know what the color means. And when I let it go, it's going gonna, it's gonna to go very fast. Because actually it's already sort of done all this. And here's puzzle one finishing up, and it took it, it took it about 45 seconds. When it's done checking its work, it will try and figure out what the theme of the puzzle is. And I'm going to talk a bit later about how it actually does this. So it says, no theme I understand, no apparent rebus, it knows about rebus puzzles. And then colors the whole thing blue, that means I'm done. Turn it, raise your hand, Ginsburg, and turn the paper in. So there's puzzle one. 
Puzzle two was harder. <laughs> So puzzle two takes it eight seconds. <laughs> it's harder. And now it's going to run around and do the same thing you saw before as it tries to consider filling the puzzle without these various words. Now obviously on these, it doesn't help because the puzzle's already right. But in many cases, and you'll see some later, where it's made mistakes, throwing out these words lets it find ways around them as it finds fills that avoid the mistakes it's made before. It says puzzle, puzzle two is moderate. I actually told it how hard, figure I'm allowed to because that's in the handout we get, how hard each of the puzzles is expected to be. So that's puzzle two, which it also got right. Now we have Myrtle Reblin. <laughs> <laughs> so same deal, on the goes. The red stuff means it's not working so well. Caught sting. That's the, kind of, uh, that's the kind of thing that is a sequence of words that doesn't really know what's going on. So it colors it purple. And this, the A app, I don't know how you even pronounce that, but the, the A apt in 10 is colored red because that's not even a legal sequence of words as far as it's concerned. So it's running around, it's trying to improve things. It won't, and then it's going to analyze the themes. Now, you guys have all solved this puzzle. You know that the theme here is you take out the sound eel. It used to be the case, so it's re it found the theme, I'll get back to that, and now it's reanalyzing everything, given the theme. So Maura Jacobson made puzzle six for many years, and I have a special Maura Jacobson mode in Dr. <laughs> Phil, because her puzzles had a lot in common with each other. There were all these phonetic themes, and it, it always was the case that they weren't all, they were sort of like mostly the same, but they weren't all exactly the same. And I figured when Moore stopped constructing, sadly, I took that out. But Merle did it to Dr. Phil again here. So one of the reasons Dr. Phil, Dr. Phil says the theme is to add an S sound, which is just totally wrong. It actually knows that this is a phonetic puzzle. But, it's not at all happy because it thinks that, that Merle is, is Merle here? I'm sure Merle's here. I'm sorry, Merle. Dr. Phil is sorry. I don't I actually don't care. But <laughs> it thinks that you haven't honored the theme. So if you look at um, Wing, West Virginia, that's supposed to be take the eel out of Wheeling, West Virginia. But Wheeling, West Virginia isn't actually pronounced that way. It starts with an HW. It's Wheeling, West Virginia. And if you take the e at eel out, you get Wing, West Virginia, and that's not this. Over here, you've got the R thing, which is supposed to be like the real thing, but it's not the R thing, it's the R thing. And why do you think you can turn that into the real thing by adding eel? That's not right. <laughs> Down here, you have the Captain N10. But they're not called the Captain and Tenniel. They're called the Captain and Tenniel. So Dr. Phil thinks this is totally wrong. <laughs> now it knows about these weird, you know, if I labeled it a more Jacobson puzzle, it would have been fine. But it knows that sometimes you just have pun puzzles. And that's where you make a bunch of sound changes that maybe are, have commonalities and maybe don't. But on this particular one, it has way too much respect for Merle. So it doesn't think he would do that. <laughs> so, so it gets it totally wrong. And it's Merle's fault. That's all I'm trying to say. <laughs> okay, this is puzzle four. <clears throat> this also went pretty well. So this is right. This took eight seconds, or six seconds, I think. And as before, it's going to spend the rest of the minute checking it. Um, and then I think it doesn't figure out a theme like this. So every time there's a flash, it's completely resolving the puzzle, removing some of the some of the words that it's told aren't allowed. Yeah, so it's done. It says no theme. I understand. No apparent reason. It's done. It's all good. So here's here's puzzle five, courtesy of BQ. 
And one of the things that's interesting about this puzzle is you'll actually, it doesn't do very well. It's not that interesting. But you'll actually see the search helping. So this is his first solution. And it's totally messed up in many places. And as you see it make these changes, it's getting stuff right. And I was watching it solve in the back. I actually expected it to get this puzzle. Because usually once it gets into this kind of mode, it eventually manages to get all the way through. This particular one, it didn't. And let me talk a little bit about why. Because again, I think the mistakes are sort of inst instructive. So over here, <coughs> this is actually very close. So it's got shill for laid back in slang. And it thinks, well, I don't really know what's going on. But it's quite happy about snap, which is a break in the winter. Because you have all these cold snaps in winter. So winter says, oh, snap, that's got to be right. Especially because it's got the AP. It's awesome. The right answer is chap, but it doesn't know. So it, doesn't, it isn't able to fix those two letters. It actually thinks its solution here, it actually looks at, it looks at chap down here. And it thinks that its solution is better than what it would have gotten if it had put chap in. Because it really doesn't know what's going on. Down here, <coughs> sorry, in the south, it actually likes BEQ solution. I've got one, but thank you. Thanks. It actually likes BEQ solution better. But the algorithms it's using turn out not to be good enough to find it. This happens when I want to, when I make a bunch of changes, I typically retest Dr. Spell on 100 New York Times puzzles it's never seen before. It is very rare that I see a situation where it actually likes the solution the author intended, the constructor intended better, but it can't find it. This was one of those. Part of this turns out to be my fault. I don't know which, let me find it. So somewhere in here is um, Houdini. Oh, it's up here. Yeah. So I looked at this, and one of the things I did when I was creating Dr. Phil's database is I took every Wikipedia title and every word in every Wikipedia title I made sure it was in the database. Well, this is Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin. And it's hyphenated. So this, the Houdin part, I did not think this is my fault as a programmer. I didn't realize that was an independent word that could stand on its own so Houdin doesn't appear in the database. If it did, the top, the, the northwest there would have flipped. Because this again was very close. It really didn't like the solution I had, but it thought the was even stupider. <laughs> okay, so the last puzzle that it did today was number six. And again, this is <clears throat> this is Anna's puzzle. This is interesting. Um, so it rips through this, makes the same mistake that many of you did. <laughs> putting um, Tessa, Tessa in for Jessa, and I haven't looked at why, I can, I can actually look at why now. It's Jansport and Jessa. Jansport was, um, they, they both were horrible, so it's scoring both of them is 19, a big number is bad, so I thought they were both awful. So, um, it may be the chance for not on the database either. Okay, so now it's looking for the theme. This was so frustrating for me. And it actually figures out the theme is to add her, which is right. So, armed with this knowledge, it goes back and it resolves the puzzle and makes an extra mistake. Because this word down here, offer sites, for some reason it prefers off sites to off size. And they're both now all of a sudden legit because they're supported by the theme. And it doesn't know that, um, it can't distinguish for what a waiter, whoops, that's not offer, offer sites. Sites. Uh, Attractive girl in modern lingo. 
It has no idea what that has to do with times or times or, or anything. So it figures out the theme. I thought, excellent, it's figured out the theme, and then it goes and makes an extra mistake. So that's what Dr. Phil has done so far, and Will has assured me that it's just going to completely crash and burn tomorrow before we start. <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, Will would be sad. A lot of people would be sad. It didn't have to. I actually don't know what the score was after six. It said at the bottom, I had missed Yeah, but it's, it's, the times are messed up and so forth and so on. Okay, so what do I have to say about all this? Because this actually I want to I want to talk about. And I, I talked, this is the table that I sort of ended a previous talk with. And I talked about the difference in how machines solve problems and how people, that's the games, how machines play games and how people can play games. And basically I argued that, that people use pattern recognition. So if you think about a chess master, he will look at a board and he'll just understand what the position is about. And Gary Kasparov, for example, has said that he looks at about 20 positions when he's analyzing what to do in an average chess position. Deep blue, on the other hand, looks at zillions of positions. Zillions is technical, it means about 10 to the 10. All the other games are the same. Poker, people use rules, they use table presence, computers look at these huge systems of linear equations. In all games, including crosswords, computers solve with search instead of trying to solve by pattern recognition. But there's another way to think about this, and that's what I want to talk about tonight, what computers are really doing is they're using big data. And everybody hears about big data all the time on the news these days, and that's what Dr. Phil is doing. So it's this big data approach, and people use a small data approach to solving problems like this, because we look at a relative handful of, of possibilities. And the question that I want to talk about is why is it that Dr. Phil uses big data? And this is the answer. I'm going to get back to this. This is a picture from the Deepwater Horizon spill. And this, as I will show you, is why Dr. Phil uses big data. But first, let me go back to, to sort of where all this comes from. And you know, this shouldn't be a surprise. Solving a crossword puzzle problem really involves some sort of natural language processing. And people have tried to get computers to solve natural language problems for a very long time. And the difficulty is that natural language processing is what what people in computer science call AI complete. And what that really means is you have to solve all of artificial intelligence to really do it. You actually have to do whatever it is that AI is about. So let me start by talking about what artificial intelligence is about. Artificial intelligence is a name invented by John McCarthy in 1955. And that's John. And <clears throat> The definition, if you look on Wikipedia, they'll say that John described AI as the science and engineering of making intelligent machines. And what this really shows you is that you can't trust Wikipedia. So I knew John, I knew John very well. He did not look like this. I don't think I ever saw him in a suit. He was constantly making jokes. All scientists, I mean, fine and coffee, I've known these folks, and they're all crack ups, right? They don't want to look like you. Do you want to look like this? So, when I started doing AI, John told me what he thought AI was. And if you look at computer science, computer science is basically trying to get computers to do really well what people do badly. So, we are terrible at balancing checkbooks. So, the idea is to get computers to do it well. We are terrible at dealing with databases of billions of facts. So the idea is to get computers to do it well. And what John told me is that AI is an attempt to get computers to do badly what people do well. <laughs> and he was right. Okay, so lots of people in AI try and do these things like natural language processing that people are really good at, and they're terrible. So the first one I'm going to sort of talk about is common sense reasoning. I'm going to, I'm going to try. <clears throat> and do a little demo of this. So I did, John spent most of the last half of his career working on common sense reasoning. And when I started doing it, I was with him, I worked on common sense reasoning. And there's this maxim in artificial intelligence that you work on what you're lousy at. 
And my wife will tell you this is perfect for me because I have no common sense whatsoever. So I actually came to understand the kinds of mistakes that machines would make in terms of common sense reasoning. So I need a volunteer. I'm not going to get a volunteer. Come on. All right, so we're going to have a brief conversation. Just, you know, be yourself, and I'll do my best to emulate a computer. So what's your name? Robert. My name is Phil, with an F. People get that wrong a lot. Where are you from? Uh, I live in Westchester. How did you get here? By train. How did you get here? <laughs> I was put in a little box, and I showed up. <laughs> How are you getting home? I train. What do you mean you're going to little box you? I'm asking the questions. <laughs> so, how are you going to find your train? I'm going to go to Grand Central and find the train. How are you going to get to Grand Central? I'm going to take the subway. How are you going to? <laughs> how are you going to find the subway? I know where it is. Where is it? Uh, <laughs> what is what if they moved it? Then I would look up where it is. What if they moved it and didn't tell anybody? <laughs> then I would find a different subway. What if they moved Grand Central? <laughs> They're not going to move Grand Central. How do you know that? Because why would they move Grand Central? <laughs> Who would stop them? But they have no reason to move Grand Central. What about your house? Where's your house? Uh, I live in an apartment in New Rochelle. What if somebody else is living in your apartment? Then? <laughs> but someone isn't living in your apartment. How do you know that? Because some, no one else has a reason to live in my apartment. There are a lot of homeless people in New York. I mean, no one has a reason to live in my apartment specifically. The chances of that happening are so minute, it's not, it's not worry about it. I think you should check it out. So, so, you don't know where the subway is. You just have this vague suspicion of where the subway is. You don't really know where Grand Central is. You have some vague... What if there are no trains from Grand Central back to Rochester? Uh, then I'm gonna take a cab, I guess? I don't know. You know how much a cab would cost? <laughs> Like a hundred bucks, I don't really have a backup plan. <laughs> so you've got this situation where you don't know where Grand Central is, you don't know where the subway is, you don't know where your apartment is. For all you know, somebody new to Rochester, and you have no backup plan at all. Westchester, sorry. And you have no backup plan. Yeah. And that doesn't bother you. <laughs> well, it would bother me. Thank you. really stupid when I stand up here and try and do it. But this is exactly the kinds of things that machines are really terrible at. And they will get just as confused. Actually, I wasn't really that confused. But they really will get confused about, you know, where is Westchester? Where is a taxi? What if somebody, you know, what if, what if you couldn't find a taxi? What if they were all taken? That actually happens in New York. And what if it just kept happening for like days and you were stranded on the sidewalk? <laughs> So they worry about all these things. Similarly, natural language processing is incredibly hard. And you have to somehow reason by common sense to understand what sentences mean. So I'm going to give you some examples. There was a very early attempt at natural language processing. And what they did, they went to see how they would do it. So they took a sentence in English, they translated it into Russian, and then they translated it back into English. And the question was, what would come out? And what came out was 
the vodka is good, but the meat is rotten. And this is all fine until you realize that the sentence they started with was the <laughs> You don't know what any of it means. You're just translating one word So then there was actually there was a breakthrough. I think it's actually legitimate to call it a breakthrough. People realize that if you can't figure out what's going on, and we can't, just use statistics. And they started doing this is big data. They started doing all this analysis that you know if spirit is near willing. Oh, that means one thing, but if spirit is near intoxicated, that means something else. So it's big data, applied to natural language understanding. It is the reason that you can talk to your smartphones at all. They often don't know what you mean, but the reason they have even a remote clue is because of this kind of approach. So let me give you some examples from crosswords. And these aren't nearly as clever as well as and when you figure it out, just yell it out and I can keep going. One who is rubbed out, five letters. Gene. Okay. Halter for a horse. Whoa. <laughs> leaves, leaves on the table. Salad. 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 Okay. In all of these examples, big data works great. So you have a horse. Well, people, they're all to woe and horse. That happens a lot. And halter doesn't even think about the other meaning. It just strips off the ER and says halt. Well, that means woe and stop and so forth. Genies, you know, that exact phrasing you may not have seen. I don't think it ever has been used. But lots of clues for genies involve rubbing out and, and all that kind of stuff. Leaves and salad and salad and table. All of this happened. happened. This is how Dr. Phil does stuff. And it works. It's good enough most of the time. So the clues are ambiguous. They're designed to be ambiguous. That's what makes solving crosswords fun. It's what makes constructing crosswords fun. But big data doesn't care. It just sort of rides right over the ambiguity and clues and manages to complete the puzzle anyway. So there are a bunch of examples of ambiguity showing up in natural language processing. And we all deal with it. And it's not an issue. One of the most famous is due to Groucho Marx. Time, I got that backwards. Time flies like an arrow, fruit flies like a banana, sorry about that. So, you've got, you've got this example on the face of it, these two sentences look exactly the same, they should parse the same, but they actually parse completely differently. Leaves at the table. Two completely different parses were capable of dealing with the ambiguity. I wrote an AI textbook, and this was an example that I put in the book. I hit the man on the chest with a hammer. This is a massively ambiguous sentence. Did I use a hammer? Did the man on the chest have a hammer? Was there a painting on the, of, a of a hammer on the chest? Was the man standing on the chest? Did I hit him on the chest? This is a tremendously ambiguous sentence. We have no trouble dealing with it. The reason this sentence was in my book is because my favorite example of an ambiguous sentence, the publisher would not allow me to put in the book but I can use it now. <laughs> so, we deal with ambiguity all the time. We deal with it well. There's one more example I want to give you. This is a true story. It's the MOA example. And to tell you about this, I actually have to give you a little bit of personal information about myself. Please don't make me regret this. So I, I went to Oxford. I was on the faculty there for a few years. And when I was there, I was engaged to a, a British girl. And I came home a year before she finished. And the deal was I was going to come home and I was going to live my life. And she was going to come over a year later. We were going to marry her and live happily ever after. And she didn't. And I was crushed. I was just completely devastated. I, nobody would, you know, I, I should have just, I should have been, I was a social outcast for years, which I knew, because I knew I was just a wreck. 
And what I did in the five years it took me to get over it, seems to make sense, right? That it all, the story is good because now I have a plane and a better wife. So this is the plane. This is me in it. My mom was not at all happy with this plan. The picture is not upside down. So here you can see the sun on the elevator on the tail. So the sun really is up there. So I get to fly around on this plane. It's lots of fun. And I lived in California. And one day in California, I decided I wanted to go flying. So before I get to that, I have to, I have to tell you about MOA. So who here knows what a MOA is? Well, do do crosswords. You all know what a MOA is. A MOA, generally appearing only in crosswords, is any of a variety of usually very large extinct flightless birds of New Zealand. It's the kind of thing you talk about every day. <laughs> it turns out that in the aviation world, there's another meaning for MOA. MOA stands for Military Operations Area. They're generally big. They're like the size of Delaware. And they start about 10,000 feet off the ground. They go to maybe 20,000 feet off the ground. You're not supposed to fly in them because you could get shot down. And that's bad for people in these little biplanes. It's just terrible. Or there could be another plane going by at Mach 1 and a half. It's just, you, you look on the map and you don't, you stay out of active moments. It's really important, this is drilled into you. So here I am, here's, here's the Bay Area. There's San Francisco up there. San Carlos, my little plane is based in San Carlos right here. So there I am, ready to go flying. And before I go flying, I'm, I, at St. Carlos, you dial up and you get what's called ATIS, which is Advanced Terminal Information Service. It's the weather. Before you take off, you're supposed to get the weather. So I dial up and I get the weather. And it gives me the usual stuff. And then it says, all pilots, beware of the MOA to the east of the field. So I think, oh man, this is bad. Because I do not, this is not an encounter that I, I one half. So I call the tower and tell them I'm ready to taxi. And I say, what about the MOA to the east of the field? Am I supposed to call Open Center to find out more about that? Open Center is who you talk to in your airborne in the Bay Area. And they say, no, that's, that's not going to be a problem. So immediately I sort of downgrade the MOA to this. And then they say, actually, it's located between taxiways B and C. So now I think, well, it's supposed to be the size of Delaware. I think it's probably one guy with a rocket launcher. So that's my current view of the level. But in all honesty, I'm still worried. They've been very reassuring. But I still, I, you know, it's Arnold, right? I don't want to mess with this guy with a rocket launcher between taxiways B and C. So I stop and I just sit there and I don't start taxiing. I think about it and I realize that there is, in fact, another definition of a mobile. <laughs> so I call the tower back and I say, oh, it's a mower. And the tower's reaction, they're not able to respond. Their reaction is identical to yours. Right? So I just listen, there's just cackling coming over the <laughs> Okay, so why does Dr. Phil use big data? Well, the answer is that for a computer, it is very hard to recognize speech. And that happens over and over and over again. So, you're going to use big data to solve this speech recognition problem. It's got some strengths, it's got some weaknesses. You actually saw both in the Dr. Phil demo. The biggest pro is, is you do not have to understand what you're doing. You can just close your eyes and stumble through, and it will work well enough most of the time. The con is you somehow have to separate the signal from the noise. And it turns out that that can be incredibly hard. So let me give you a little clip from Jeopardy. This is Watson on Jeopardy. Seconds, 
So the category, I'm sorry, I got clipped. The category was U.S. cities. <laughs> and they actually asked the Watson team about this. And here's, here's what, I'm not, this is the video, this is, is an audio. And here's what they had to say. First of all, category titles aren't worth much, and Watson tends not to pay attention to them because they're really just confusing anyway. That's how I feel about the notepad stuff on crosswords and Dr. Phil. So crosswords titles they don't pay a lot of attention to. Secondly, there are lots of cities named Toronto. This is the explanation they gave. There are lots of cities named Toronto in the United States. And lastly, the Canadian <laughs> So, separating the signal from the noise using big data is incredibly hard. It's incredibly hard. And the bottom line is when you use big data, all that you'll ever get is a hint as to what the right answer is. And Dr. Phil, when you see it coloring the things, you know, green and blue and purple and black, it doesn't know when it has the right answer. It just sort of sniffs at the right answer. It suspects it has the right answer. In spite of that, Watson works. Dr. Phil works. It's not going to win, but it's, it's fairly good and it's getting better. So what I want, what I want to end with, I want to talk about what this actually means. So in the crossword world, when you're solving a puzzle and you have to figure out what the theme is, what you do is you fill in all the crossword words and then you notice that this weird phrase has shown up in the crossword. And you look at it and you say, well, that, that's not in the language. What, where did that come from? You say, oh, well, I took a normal phrase and I added an ER. And then you go and you do, you use that to inform the rest of your solution. That's not how Dr. Phil does it at all. And the reason is because in order for that to work, you have to be really sure about all these crossing words that you put in. You have to know that this bizarre, out of the language phrase is right because you've got to draw conclusions from it. Dr. Phil doesn't work that way. Dr. Phil guesses, because that's really all it's doing, at all the crossing words. And then it looks at all the theme entries and it looks for commonalities. It says, oh, I added an ER in three separate places. That's probably the theme. Or I added this particular sound in three separate places. Or I took out this sound. So it's, it is guessing everywhere. And maybe there are five theme entries and two of them are totally wrong. But the three that are left are typically enough for it to actually figure out what the theme is. Because it looks for modifications that happen more often than other things. And it's got all these rules about how it has to do that. And the reason it has to do it this way, unlike you, Dr. Phil is never sure about the crossing words. They're all guesses. And I have developed technology that will let it use those guesses to try and figure out what the theme of any particular puzzle is. So that's big data and crosswords, but there's also sort of big data in the real world. And the, the consequences here are probably more profound. Because the answer is still the same. Conclusions drawn from big data are never ironclad. They're always guesses as you try and separate the signal from the noise. So Google, when it gives you an answer to a search query, it's conditioning that on every query you've ever asked it, and it's trying every link you've ever clicked on from the answer, and it's trying to figure out from that what are you interested in? What did you probably mean by that query? And that's how Google is doing it. If, you, if you've got kids or, or somebody who's a different computer than you, and you type a query into Google on your computer and a query into Google on their computer, you'll get completely different results because Google is conditioning it based on what it thinks you want. If you go to the grocery and you, get, you check out and you get the, the receipt and it's got all the coupons on the back, that's all conditioned. It's certainly conditioned on what you just bought. And if you belong to one of these frequent buyer programs where you, you know, then it's, believe me, they are accumulating every bit of knowledge they can about everything you have ever bought. And they're trying to give you coupons that are either for pro not for products you've bought so much, but for competitors to products you've bought. So it's all, but it's still all guesses 
I've never used one of those clip-ups because usually it's stupid. So they're guessing. But every time you do, they win. And it's scary when and the NSA, these great gatherers of big data, say that they're going to use it to only look at the terrorists. No. That's not how it works. They are using the data to inform their guesses about who's a terrorist. And I, and I hope they catch them all. But they don't know. They simply are trying to make slightly better guesses with all this information they're collecting. So in a world driven by big data, and our world is increasingly becoming like this, everybody acts moderately indiscriminately. Because all of the big data agencies are doing the best they can with the data they have. But none of it is ironclad. All of it is <coughs> trying to separate the signal from the noise, trying to make decisions a little bit better than they would have otherwise, and that's the best you can do. What tends to happen is the bad behavior gets worse, the privacy infringements are scarier, and they also happen more often because people are guessing and they're acting on the guesses with which they have become relatively comfortable instead of the old fashioned way, which was you really figured it out. You figured out the theme. Dr. Phil can't do that, so it guesses and sort of plunges forward. I'm not saying this is bad, I'm not saying the NSA is evil, I'm just saying it's incredibly important for everybody in modern society to realize that this is what decisions driven by big data look like because they impact all of our lives. All right, enough. So, if you have questions, I'll happily answer them until everyone tells me to shut up. Yeah. So are you allowed to access Google during the tournament? <laughs> so the question was, why doesn't Dr. Phil look on Google? And it's playing by the same rules you are. It truly is. And, pardon? <laughs> so one of, the, one of the conditions that Will and I have agreed on is that I do not use the internet during this all. I think, I think that's totally right. Yeah. Yeah. I want to know, if I took all the clues away, how would Dr. Phil do? It would be hopeless. So I, I hear this, and a particular crossword frame grid will have so many fills. It has a huge number of legitimate fills. So without the clues, it truly gets poor. There are just too many ways to fill in the grid. Yeah? You mentioned Dr. Phil uh, improving. In the last couple of years, whatever mistakes uh, it made, like for example today, can it, is it built in, like, can it learn, is it going to learn by itself to fix those certain errors, or is it something that you can... Yeah, Dr. Phil doesn't learn, I learn. Um, and because it's big data, I am learning in a big data kind of way. So there are about 30 parameters, pretty little knobs I can dial. So, for example, one of the crossword rules is the part, the part of speech of the answer has to match the part of speech of the query. And, my, and the question I had is, well, what, how much confidence do I have in that? And I can dial that up and have more confidence, or dial it down and have less confidence. And what I do is I, I twiddle all these 30 knobs, and then I solve 100 New York Times crossword puzzles, and I see if it's gotten better or worse, and I try and tune them to optimize performance against that particular metric. Relative to last year, Dr. Hill is not doing as well, I don't think, in the tournament this year as it did last year. But on a relatively large number of New York Times puzzles, its average score using the ACPT scoring has gone up by about 3%, which is a big number. So I appear to be making progress. It's just the bullseye thing is working unusually well. <laughs> Whatever. Um, I appear to be making progress, but it may well not be reflected in a particular set of seven puzzles. Yep. Is there like a specific type of theme puzzle that Dr. Phil is really bad at? Like something that you haven't been able to do? Um, do I ask that? I mean, how, how big does this bullseye have to be? <laughs> so, um, do you want me to put the cute kid back up or are we good? 
Is that your kid? No, it's not my kid. All right, I'll put her back up, though. I don't know who's kid. Um, so, yes, it can do read his puzzles. What Dr. Phil tends not to understand, and the only reason I'm telling you this, I think I know how to fix it, is when things are clustered. So there's a read of Doe, and another is Ray, and me, Faso, Lati, Doe. Dr. Phil doesn't, it doesn't understand those at all because it figures the rebus has to be one thing. Now, it, it does know that those are all instances of notes. There was a puzzle in the Times, I think this week, about something in boxes. Soap, soap, soap boxes. Soap. And you have all these soaps that were re different rebuses. So Dr. Phil finds those very hard. It finds things like, um, so I have puzzles that I make every now and then called takeaway crosswords, where the clues are missing a letter. Um, like there would be G missing from the clues, and that means you take G out of the answer, so eggnogs becomes enos. Dr. Phil has no idea what's going on there. Um, there was a, a puzzle this year where, um, I don't remember the exact field, but bending around would be around and then B, for B ending around. And all the theme entries were like that. Dr. Phil can't do that because it just doesn't understand. So the stuff that is very neat, that really requires sort of world knowledge, it really can't get. Because you really can't get it with the big data approach. You really have to know what's up. Yeah? Yeah, boring software engineering question. Um, are you able to make use of any open source domain specific software like um, Rules Engine or something like that, or is it not worth it? So I do use open source software when it helps. For example, there's an open source project at Carnegie Mellon that does pronunciation, and that's inside Dr. Phil. And it produces one pronunciation for each word, and it's very picky, which is why wheeling is wheeling and not wheeling. But it's the best thing I could find for that. Yeah? You said he starts out with the uh, longer word, says he scans the grid. Since in a crossword, most of those are going to be the most difficult or funny or tricky answers. So the reason, <clears throat> so what it's doing when it scans the word is it's actually building an entire table of how likely every <coughs> word in the language is to fill that slot. So independent of crossers, independent of everything. When it starts looking at these out of the language phrases, there is special code that updates that table. But just building that table, it's looking at each word completely in isolation. And because I want them all, so I've got eight, I can run eight processors simultaneously on my, on my notebook. So I want all eight to finish at the same time, so I've used them all. I don't want seven to be waiting for the last one to finish. And the short words finish fastest, which is why they're done last. Pardon? Yeah, so it's just a scheduling thing. You're going to do them all anyway, so it's just I'm going to do them all anyway, exactly. You're going to wait the shorter ones a little bit more? I, um, it turns out that there's some value to waiting three-letter words slightly, especially, but I tried that and I by and large couldn't get it to work. I actually have a list of stuff that I tried that I couldn't get to work. And it's, I don't even know why I do it, because there's, there's stuff on there that actually says you tried this twice. <laughs> and, I just, and this year, one of the things, I just couldn't believe it that it didn't work, even though I had tried it twice. So I tried it again, and it actually worked. So, um, obviously, I'm implementing it a little bit differently, I'm thinking about it a little bit differently. It's something that had, so I still have this list, but I don't know that I'm ever going to trust it again. But that's that's how it goes. Yeah. How are the clues provided to Dr. Phil? Dr. Phil gets across light files. So. No risk of misreading a clue. No, there's no risk of misreading a clue unless the person typing it up typed it in wrong. It does not have to do OCR. <coughs> no. How many different kinds of themes have you hard-coded into Dr. Phil? Uh, how many themes have I hard-coded into Dr. Phil? The answer is a depressingly large number. <laughs> um, and this is why I always want graduate students. So um, it's got all the add a letter, remove a letter, anagrams. It's got a bunch of sound themes. It does understand puns. It's got a wide range, it's got rebus leaves, it's got a wide range of what I call geometry themes, where a word starts this way and then starts going that way. Or two words cross and they, they do that. So it understands all of that stuff. Um, and 
all of that is in there. I can't, I have to be a little bit careful because if you put too much in, then it always finds something crazy. And it says, oh, this is that kind of puzzle. And so for example, the geometry themes for the tournament this year, I actually said on an easy puzzle, which is like under 30 minutes, assume it's not one of these crazy geometry themes because those are always in the really twos and the fives and the, the really hard puzzles. So I'm trying to be a little bit slower. <coughs> One of the things that I've wondered about is a lot of puzzles have backwards words. There was a puzzle a couple of years ago where every other row was backwards. So I could just take every word and add its inverse to the database, but then the amount of garbage that would come out would be stunning. So I have to be I have to be careful to have it actually really think. And when I add a new theme, I have to spend a lot of time tuning things. You know, how many theme entries do there have to be? Can there be short ones? What if it's, you know, so more, usually themes are located symmetrically, but sometimes the last symmetric one is a reveal. So you've got to make sure all that stuff is in there and it's doing its best to try and figure that all out. But a bunch of them is, I don't know, 15% of the code, just guessing, is about theme entries. Yeah? Uh, is there any situation where Dr. Phil takes into account the date of the puzzle, like for Valentine's Day or I think a few years ago, oh. Darwin's birthday? No, I do not. Uh, that's a good idea. It will never help me with the ACPT. So I, I'm, I'm going to just close my eyes. Yeah. Does Dr. Phil have a different success rate? Pre short CN versus short CN? So I haven't, I haven't tried that. I suspect it would very much. One of the reasons, pardon? The question was is the success rate different in pre short CN versus short CN puzzles? And um, I like those puzzles a lot more. I think they're a lot more interesting, and there's a lot more wordplay, and that's part of what makes Dr. Phil fun. I can tell you that Dr. Phil regularly does much better on the New York Times puzzles than it does on the ACPT puzzles. And the reason I believe is because Will, I don't think, edits the clues as, as heavily, I think is probably the right word, for the ACPT puzzles. And all my knob tuning, I think I've got real sort of dialed in. <laughs> so when it comes to the ACPT, it's all different again. And Dr. Phil definitely does not do as well. Now I've got enough ACPT puzzles now that I can tune on them. The problem is that once these out of the language phrases appear in an ACP puzzle, they sneak into my database. And then they're all of a sudden in the language. And I tried knocking out all the ACPT puzzles, but then it turns out that some of the old constructors of ACPT puzzles would publish them on their websites and they would sneak into my database that way. <laughs> and just getting them out of the database was not on impossible. So it's very difficult to tune on the ACPT puzzle specifically. So I Will is kind enough to keep producing the New York Times puzzles and I keep using them. <laughs> yeah, David. So some people have complained that the New York Times themes are very repetitive. Is there any way you can use Dr. Phil to uh, support or refute that claim? <laughs> I don't know why I would do that. <laughs> so the question is whether I should I should support or refute the claim that New York Times themes are repetitive using Dr. Phil. Um, it is hard to create a truly original crossword. I try all the time. Every, I'm sure all the constructors try all the time. Every now and then there is one. There was a puzzle that I love where it would have like Apollo 11, 180 degrees, and the answer was snoo snooey up or something, but when you rotate it 180 degrees, it actually says moon mission. It says all those letters are still letters, and there was 90 degrees and 270 degrees, and that's just totally novel, no puzzle ever before like it, probably no puzzle ever again like it, and those, you know, and the, the bending around puzzle, something totally unique like that, I really don't think, I can do, but you don't see many of those. They're really, they're really tough to construct. In the back. Does Dr. Phil take into account the, uh, uh, the constructor? Is that part of the metric in figuring out the puzzle that certain means constructed? Only if it's more Jacobs. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, I haven't been able to, I haven't been able to find anything I can really latch on to. I don't, I don't, I don't trigger on BDQ, although maybe I should. You know, Dr. Phil actually has a tremendous amount of trouble with Brendan's puzzles. Curse him. <laughs> <laughs> a feeling that I think many of you share. Right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah. yeah. I noticed that on one of the puzzles I got stuck on thinking that Offred was more, uh, or Afri, was more uh, likely than about for the uh, helpful website. And I'm wondering whether, if you looked at that at all, and why it got stuck that way. Was that today? Yeah, that was today. So the answer to that is, is definitely no. I am looking at anything today. Um, when I, and so I have various tools that help me understand why words get particular scores. These days, when I unwind them, it's really somewhere deep in the knot in the, in the knot to me, and it's difficult to do a whole lot better without making other things worse because it's a big data thing. All you're doing is finding the signal. Yep. Oh yeah, I mean, Dr. Phil will typically, I, I often run them, Dr. Phil will run through the C puzzle in a handful of seconds and make no mistakes. On the B puzzle, it'll get somewhere between zero and three letters wrong, and on the A puzzle, it will often get shelled and it will often do much better than that, with much more variance. So thank you all for preparing this. I will keep coming back until you have no choice but to applaud for Dr. Phil. Let me say one thing. Uh, you know, we tend to think of uh, this being humans versus computer, human ingenuity against uh, a computer, and it's really human ingenuity versus human ingenuity. If Matt ever fine tunes or is able to achieve Dr. Phil so it can beat human solvers, it's human ingenuity that's able to do that. So that's what we would apply. Okay, don't forget 9 o'clock tomorrow morning and daylight saving time starts, so you're losing an hour tonight. Also, don't remember, remember your labels. Bring your labels tomorrow. So, I have a feeling. <laughs> Yeah, why not? Oh, so there's a subject, so I'm going to get a real kick out of it. I'll set you up.